Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm John. I'm a PhD student in the Safari Research Group led by Professor Anur Mutlu at ETH Zurich. Uh, today, I'll present uh, Rohash. Uh, so let me give you an executive summary. So we can uh, analyze uh, genomes in real time while the raw sequencing data is generated from sequencing devices. However, uh, performing real-time genome analysis is uh, usually inaccurate and inefficient, especially for large genomes. Uh, causing serious barriers in fully exploiting the opportunities in uh, real-time genome analysis. So our goal in this work is to enable efficient and accurate analysis, uh, again, especially for large genomes, while the raw sequencing is, uh, data is being generated uh, in real-time. So to this end, uh, uh, raw hash encodes the raw sequencing data into hash values to accurately and efficiently identify similarities between signals by matching their uh, corresponding hash values efficiently. And by analyzing the uh, genomes in real time, raw hash can make some real time decisions that can stop sequencing a DNA molecule without fully sequencing it. We also propose a technique uh, called sequence until that can accurately and dynamically stop the entire sequencing of all DNA molecules at once if further uh, sequencing of reads are not uh, necessary, for, a, for example, for a specific use case. So in our results, we show that Rohash provides up to uh, 2x more accurate mapping results compared to the state of the artworks. It also provides around uh, 26x and 3.4x better average throughput compared to these state of the artworks, namely uncode and sigmap respectively. Uh, the sequence until technique enables reducing the sequencing time and cost by 15x. So I'll give a brief uh, background on genome sequencing, although we covered this a lot in the previous uh, uh, talks. So I'll be try to be relatively uh, quick here. So genome sequencing uh, enables us to determine, as we know, the order of the DNA sequence in an organism's genome. So it also plays a pivotal role in many applications, such as precision medi medicine and so on. And in this talk, we're going to be uh, specifically focusing on uh, nanopore sequencing, uh, which is a widely used uh, sequencing technology, which can also be portable. Uh, so nanopore sequencing can sequence uh, large fragments of DNA uh, from 10 kilobases to 2 million base pairs. It has high throughput. Uh, it is relatively low cost. And it has some uh, unique features that I'm going to be covering in my next slides. Uh, so I'll show how nanopore sequencing is used uh, in a traditional uh, genome analysis pipeline. Uh, here, uh, DNA or RNA molecule is sequenced while it goes through a tiny pore uh, called nanopore. So these uh, nanopores sample the current readings uh, while the nucleic acids move through uh, nanopores, which is provided as electrical signals. So here the idea is whenever a new nucleic acid moves into a nanopore, uh, it creates uh, abrupt changes in the current reading, such that these abrupt changes can be used to identify the nucleic acids uh, from electrical uh, signal readings. So, and these signal uh, signals are usually called raw signals. And the next step is usually to translate these raw signals into their uh, corresponding uh, bases, the sequences of bases, essentially in a step called a base problem. And here to do so, uh, usually a DNM-based tools uh, are used uh, 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 to convert them to their bases. And the next, so we call these sequences, as you may know, reads also. And the next step, again, in the genome analysis pipeline is, is to usually identify, uh, uh, identify basically their origins in their corresponding reference genomes by, for example, mapping them to a reference genome. And a read may map to a reference genome if it shares a, a high similarity uh, between uh, a read and the reference genome, so it can be mapped, or it may share, uh, it may be too dissimilar, and so it won't be mapped. But the idea is that we can use this read mapping information uh, to do some further genome analysis and hopefully to make some scientific discoveries. But I also want to focus on the, this unique feature that we have in nanopore sequencing, uh, so here, in, in essential nanopore sequencing, uh, it provides us uh, with a unique feature uh, where we can analyze the sequencing data in real time and make some decisions uh, based on this real time analysis. So as um, DNA moves through uh, nanopore, uh, as also mentioned in the previous slide, it provides raw signal data in real time at a certain throughput, at a certain rate. 
So this means that we can analyze these signals also in real time uh, using efficient computational tools that are uh, um, at least as fast as uh, the nanopore sequencing itself. So while analyzing, what we can also do is that uh, we, can some, we, we can make some decisions uh, uh, regarding the sequencing of that particular uh, read uh, known as the adaptive sampling. So which enables us to, for example, decide if you want to keep sequencing that read or not. And based on our analysis, for example, we may decide that we don't want to keep uh, sequencing that read. For example, it may not be mapping to the reference genome that we are interested in. So this means that further sequencing uh, that read is useless for us. And it will waste uh, 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 time and cost uh, uh, if you keep sequencing it. So we can, what we can essentially do is that uh, by applying the voltage at a different position, we can reverse the polarity of the electrical field over here so that we can eject the DNA molecule uh, from the nanopore again so that we can stop sequencing that particle of group. So there are then certain objectives in real-time genome analysis. So we want to, for example, do fast analysis that can match the throughput of a sequencer. We don't want to fall behind of the sequencer so that we can make real-time decisions. Uh, we also want to do fast decisions to reduce the sequencing time and cost with the effective use of adaptive sampling. Uh, we also want to uh, perform accurate analysis uh, from noise zero signal data. And we also want to do all these computations uh, using uh, low power computations to enable uh, portable sequencing uh, and better scalability, essentially. And there are usually two solutions uh, that can perform real-time uh, analysis using nanopore uh, sequencing. But the first solution is uh, usually to use uh, deep neural networks to base call the reads while they are being generated and map them. So for example, here we uh, may, uh, may be generating this signal in real time. And what we can do is that uh, in real time also, we can base call that uh, signal and then uh, generate its corresponding sequence. And then we can make some analysis on that sequence. Again, in real time, for example, we may want to map that read to its reference genome and then decide whether we want to keep sequencing it or not. And at this point, for example, we want to keep sequencing it. The next part of the signal is generated. Again, we base call it in real time and then do some analysis. And at a certain point, for example, we may decide that we don't want to keep sequencing that particular read. Then this means that the next part of the signal actually won't be generated. Uh, and we will stop sequencing that read based on our real-time analysis. However, the issue is that the, the, these DNA-based tools are usually costly and energy hungry. So the second uh, uh, solution is to map signals without base calling them. Uh, so what happens is that again, similarly, we may be generating the signals in real time and rather than base calling it, we do some direct analysis on the signals itself. For example, we may map these signals to their reference genomes without base calling them. And again, like we can make some adaptive sampling decisions regarding the sequencing, uh, whether we want to keep sequencing it or not. And then we can, uh, again, stop sequencing it based on our uh, uh, signal analysis. But again, the issue with these tools are uh, usually twofold. They are either low throughput or they are inaccurate, uh, they provide inaccurate analysis for large genomes. So then let me uh, cover our goal and key ideas in this way. So our goal is to do, is to perform fast analysis that can scale to large genomes. We also want to make fast decisions for adaptive sampling. Uh, we want to make uh, all of our analysis, of course, as accurate as possible, uh, specifically for large genomes. And we want to do all these computations low power uh, so, so that we can, for example, utilize uh, portable uh, uh, sequencing devices. So to this end, we propose raw hash. Uh, the raw hash is the first mechanism that can efficiently and accurately map raw signals to large genomes using an efficient ha hash-based search. Uh, we also propose a technique called sequence hunter, which is a novel mechanism that can decide in runtime dynamically if further sequencing of leads is needed to stop the entire sequencing process for a particular use case. So let me then go over uh, the steps that we have in Rohash. So this figure shows the overview uh, of the steps uh, we have in Rohash. Uh, so we have essentially have two steps. Uh, uh, first step is indexing, which is an offline step, meaning we don't do that step in real time, uh, and but before real time uh, step. And the second step is the mapping, which we do in real time 
while the nanopore row signals are being generated. <clears throat> so in the indexing step, what we do is that we convert the reference genome to its signal representation. And we use this signal of the reference genome to generate some hash values uh, from them. And then we store these hash values and their positions in a hash table uh, such that we can later utilize it in the online step, which is the mapping step. So in the mapping step, similarly, uh, we again generate some hash values from raw nanopore signals. Uh, and then uh, using these hash values and the, using the hash table we generated from the reference genome signals, uh, uh, we uh, essentially identify uh, matches between the reference genome and the raw nanopore signal. And we say that there is a mapping region between the raw nanopore signal and the reference genome if there is a region with a certain number of hash value matches. Uh, by doing so, we can efficiently find similarities between the reference genome and the nanopore raw signal. So then let me uh, go over like how we uh, convert the reference genome, uh, reference sequences to signals. And even before that, why do we convert the reference sequences to, sig uh, ref reference sequences to signals? Uh, the first reason is that we want to offload the translation costs to the offline indexing step rather than doing the translation in the online real-time step. The second reason is that we want to uh, enable utilizing the rich information that we have in raw nanopore signals. For example, we may be able to identify the methylation levels using, directly using the raw nanopore signals. And to convert the reference sequence uh, to signals, we have some uh, uh, key steps. Uh, we use a KMR model, uh, which essentially provides us an expected current readings after sequencing a fixed uh, K number of nucleic acids uh, that we call KMRs. Uh, what we do is that we utilize this particular lookup table, uh, which is providing us these expected current readings to convert all KMRs of a reference genome to their expected values, to their expected uh, 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 signal values that we call events. So these events are essentially nothing but essentially a signal value representing a particular KMR. So after uh, then converting these KMRs to their expected event values, we do some again normalization so that we can uh, accurately match them in the later steps with the uh, raw signal. So that, no, that normalization part is uh, currently uh, not important to us. So, but uh, let me quickly uh, dive into uh, a little bit more like what these events are. Uh, so events are essentially nothing but a series of current readings. So these events are generated when sequencing a particular camera. So why are we focusing on a camera? Because the idea is that at a certain time, uh, 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 we know that there are actually a, a fixed, usually a fixed number of uh, uh, nucleic acids inside the pore. For example, there may be K many nucleic acids, but that's why actually we're essentially focusing on the current readings of KMR, which is uh, corresponding to a particular event. So then this means that the next event is generated when a DNA molecule is shifted by one nucleic acid, creating the next KMR or next event. So we want to identify these events because we want to identify each basis or each KMRs uh, while the DNA goes through that particular port. Uh, and these are uh, uh, um, uh, these are then essentially the regions that are corresponding to a certain chemer in the in the DNA molecule. Uh, and the next event would be identified by identifying the abrupt signal changes between two consecutive chemers. Uh, so then uh, we want to perform these event detections also in the raw nanopore signals while they are being generated in real time because we want to identify the KMRs also in the, in the raw nanopore signals. So as I said, the uh, event detection uh, identifies the regions of signals corresponding to the sequencing of certain KMRs in, an, in the DNA molecule. And to identify these abrupt changes, we perform some statistical tests that we call the segmentation step, uh, 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 which are generated basically when the DNA molecule uh, is moving through the nanopore uh, the, the, the pore itself. So we also have a particular observation, which is the nanopore sequencers won't generate exactly the same signals when sequencing the same KMR, the same DNA content. But, uh, but it will be essentially generating the uh, slightly the sim uh, similar uh, signal uh, to each other. 
So then the question is, how can we leverage this observation? Uh, so then the our goal is then to, if you want to assign the same uh, buckets or same values to the similar event values, which may be corresponding to the same k let's say, although these signal values may be uh, slightly different than each other. Uh, so to do so, we have usually uh, mainly three key steps. What we do is that we use the binary representation of event values, which are in the floating point uh, uh, format, and what we do is we take the most significant qubits uh, in this binary to approximate its value, to quantize it essentially, uh, so that we can uh, essentially generate the same uh, 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 value from slightly different uh, floating point values. Uh, we also do some, perform some pruning uh, because we have an observation that like these middle uh, binary the bits are not going to be important if these uh, values are uh, slightly similar to each other. But essentially, what we generate is that uh, we generate approximately 5-bit quantized value from a 32-bit uh, floating point value, which can be nicely approximated or not use, which can be nicely used to approximate uh, the value uh, of that the floating poly is, uh, value is representing for a particular event so that we can uh, match uh, the similar uh, event values to each other. Uh, so to uh, perform this matching, uh, what we do is that uh, 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 we essentially take these consecutive events and we want to basically enable finding efficient similar detection uh, by accurately matching the hash values uh, uh, between signals. So after taking these consecutive events, what we do is that we pack these events and use some hash function to generate the hash value of these consecutive events, which may be corresponding to the consecutive k-mers, let's say, within the signal. And we can use efficient data structures, for example, hash tables, to identify the regions with the similar event values by matching their hash values, for example, between the reference genome and the, and the raw signal. Uh, so I'll go over uh, our evaluation. Uh, so this is our evaluation methodology. So we use data sets from very small, for example, viral to large genomes, uh, human and the metagenomics data sets. Uh, we compare raw hash with uncode and SIGMAP. Uh, so raw hash uncode and SIGMAP do not require powerful computational resources, for example, GPUs, uh, to achieve efficient and portable uh, genome uh, analysis in real time. So we also have three use cases, uh, read mapping, uh, relative amounts estimation, and contamination analysis. And lastly, if time permits, I'll also quickly go over the benefits of sequence sample mechanism. Uh, so I'll first show the performance results. Here, this figure shows the, uh, the throughput results of each tool. Uh, here, we have the throughput of a, a nanopore device, uh, which is usually around uh, 450 bases per second. And these are the throughputs of each tool. Uh, and these are essentially the results for each data set over here. So what we observe is that both raw hash and uncalled can match the throughput of nanopore for all data sets. And the second observation is that SIGMAP falls behind the throughput of nanopores, especially for large genomes. Here for human genome, it falls behind the throughput of nanopore and also for relative amounts estimation, which includes all these data sets over here. It also falls behind the, uh, the nanopore sequence, which means that the SIGMAP cannot be used for real-time genome analysis for large genomes. Uh, so second, uh, we look at the sequencing time and cost benefits of raw hash and uncalled. Uh, and here we uh, calculate the number of bases that needs to be sequenced before making a decision to eject a particular read to utilize the adaptive sampling. And here the lower is better, meaning that we sequenced less amount of uh, bases, meaning we saved a lot from sequencing time and cost. And what we observe is that uh, uh, raw hash can make some fast decisions for large genomes and it reduces the sequencing time and cost uh, again, for large genomes, uh, 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 better than uncalled. Um, so I'm going to also be showing the accuracy uh, uh, results uh, specifically for mapping. Uh, here we have the accuracy results for three use cases. This is the direct read mapping to each data set. This is the mapping results for relative amounts estimation, and these are the mapping results of contamination analysis. But essentially what we observe is that Rohash provides the best accuracy uh, uh, specifically for large genomes up to 2x uh, for relative abundance estimation here when we consider the F1 uh, score over here compared to uncalled and sigma. 
uh, uh, so I'll be showing also the relative amounts of estimations that we're making uh, for each tool using each tool. Uh, here, uh, what we do is that we estimate the relative amounts relative abundance of each genome uh, compared to the baseline as generated by Minimap2. And we calculate the distance between uh, the distances that each tool generates and the ground truth uh, using, the, using the Euclidean distance, uh, essentially. But this uh, table shows the, uh, the relative amount abundances that each tool uh, uh, makes uh, here. So essentially, when you see a number here, the tool is estimating, for example, for raw hash, is estimating that the sample includes, for 12%, it includes the COVID data set, and for 47%, it includes the E. coli data set, let's say. And we also generate these relative amounts estimations uh, uh, using Minimap2, which we use as ground truth, and we compare our uh, estimations to that ground truth, and we calculate the distance over here. Uh, what we observe is that raw hash provides the relative amounts estimations closest to the ground truth, meaning it provides the best accuracy compared to uncode and sigma. Uh, so I'll quickly then uh, mention the uh, sequence sample mechanism because, because it is uh, specifically related to the sequence um, relative balance estimation. So our key insight is that do we need to keep sequencing the entire sample for all applications in genome analysis? Uh, for example, we can uh, use the uh, relative amounts estimation use case example, meaning, for example, can we predict the relative amounts estimation by sequencing only a portion of the sample rather than sequencing the entire sample and still provide accurate results? And the potential benefits would be we would be reducing the sequencing time and cost by avoiding full sequencing. So we simulated this potential benefit by randomly subsampling uh, uh, the mapping info, the, the mapping results that uncode and raw hash generates, and th these percentages are showing the uh, the sampling ratios. Here, for example, we use only 25% of the mapping that uncode generates, and using that 25% of mapping, we make we make some relative amounts estimation, and then we again calculate the distance that that we're making using only a portion of the signal. But essentially, what we are observing is that almost uh, if you use almost 1% of the entire sample, we can almost like make uh, uh, estimations almost as accurate as uh, using the entire sample. So this means that we don't really have to sequence the entire sample to make accurate estimations for relative balance estimation. So then uh, uh, the sequence until mechanism dynamically analyzes the results of a genome analysis, a use case, in this case, relative balance estimation to find outliers in the analysis. So this means that if, if, if you don't have any outlier in our previous relative amounts estimations, then we can say that the further sequencing is unlikely to change the analysis significantly. And this means that we can stop the entire sequencing, which can provide significant reduction in sequencing time and cost. So we implement the sequence until mechanism in raw hash. And what we observe is that we can stop the sequencing after sequencing only 7% of the entire sample. And the estimation that we're making using only 7% of the sample is almost identical to the one that we're making using the entire sample. But this means that sequence until dynamically stops the entire sequencing after sequencing only 7% of the entire sample while providing high accuracy. And sequencing only a portion of the sample significantly reduces the sequencing time and cost. In this case, 15x reduction. So then let me quickly conclude. Uh, uh, as I said, performing real-time genome analysis is inaccurate and inefficient for large genomes. And our goal is to make uh, real-time analysis uh, for large genomes efficient and accurate. To achieve this, raw hash encodes the similar signal values into the same quantized value to elevate the noise issues in raw signals. So it can generate the hash values from uh, quantized values to efficiently identify similarities between signals based on these hash value matches. We also propose sequence sample that can accurately and dynamically stop the entire sequencing. We provide uh, uh, significantly accurate results and better average throughput compared to uncalled and sigma. And the sequence sample mechanism enables uh, reducing sequencing time and cost. So the raw hash uh, uh, is going to appear in the proceedings of the ISMB CCB uh, this year, and it will be also presented in the ISMB conference next month. Uh, 
we also have the um, source code uh, available. You can use your source code using this QR code. So with that, uh, I'll conclude my uh, raw hash talk. I can take questions if they're in. Uh, thank you, John. Um, great, uh, great work. Uh, quick question. And again, I, I'm bringing up SquiggleNet. Mm -hmm. So SquiggleNet uh, spends a majority of its uh, uh, calculation on removing this jitter, which it does by dynamic programming. So you are not bothered by the jitter. I mean, it's not something that uh, you know uh, affects your 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 quality of your efficiency. Um, I'm not sure. So, could you elaborate what you mean by uh, jitter? I'm not sure. If I'm well, familiar. jitter means that you know when you look at the pattern, the, the squiggle pattern for the same gamer in the lookup table. Sometimes you have, uh, for example, night current sample. Suppose there is there's a, a, an average rate of 10x between the current samples and the DNA basis. So sometimes for the same DNA base, you have nine current samples, sometimes you have 10, sometimes you have 11. And uh, this alignment is what was maybe 90, 98% of uh, computational complexity in squiggle filter. So I was wondering if this, if this alignment, which you don't apparently implement, is apparently this is something which is not, which is not, which is not hurting your own performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a nice question. Uh, uh, I believe you're referring to uh, skip and stay errors, as you said, which may affect the number of, let's say, uh, readings that we're uh, having for a particular chamber uh, of the DNA molecule at the time. And also these noise issues, uh, meaning we may be generating different signals uh, even if you're sequencing the same uh, chamber. So in order to elevate the skip and stay errors, uh, we perform uh, the segmentation uh, algorithm, which is based on, uh, which is a statistical t-test, uh, uh, known as Welch's test, uh, which identifies the abrupt changes in the signal. So as you said, we cannot say that there are going to be, for example, 10 current readings for all cameras. So to uh, uh, elevate this, we use different window lengths. For example, we use a, a window length from five to 15. Uh, and using all these different window lengths, we identify the abrupt changes for all of them. And when a basically a significant abrupt change is identified in one of these windows, uh, we pick those. So the idea is that when using different windows, hopefully we're going to be elevating these skip and stay errors uh, caused by these uh, 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 the varying speed of, of uh, nanopore sequencing. But of course, like it would be ideal if you could use a single window, then this means that uh, it could also uh, significantly uh, uh, make our segmentation step uh, efficient. Uh, uh, rather than performing the segmentation for a uh, large number of uh, different window lengths. Also to elevate the, um, the noise issue, uh, reading different signals for different cameras, uh, we apply this quantization technique, which is a novel technique, right. uh, uh, so that we can assign the same values, although the signals are slightly different than each other. Okay, well, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, no more questions. So thank you again, John.